Hi. So, the last two centuries have been obviously tumultuous. And if you're looking for a couple of themes to help you understand the last couple of centuries, the theme in the 21st century has to be the overriding theme, has to be the shift from analog to digital. In other words, from finite to infinite, from tangible to intangible. And in the process of that change, the consumer became, in a sense, the product because the consumer was used by usually multinational corporations as a conduit for data. Not just hard data, not just numbers, but also just in terms of security and trying to debug programs, which of course requires on some level surveillance. And one of the quotes that I looked at, I happened to see this week, uh, was by whistleblower Snowden, and the ex-NSA contractor, who said that, you know, our lives would be a little bit more understandable if we called social media companies what they really are, which is surveillance companies. All right. Now, what about the 20th century? The 20th century is much more difficult to characterize briefly. But if you think about it, one way to try to do it would be to, to say that the 20th century was about people in power deciding to enforce predictability and stability. And, and in doing so, generating a backlash against authority. And of course, some of that backlash spilled over into the 21st century. But there's another reason why, especially in the West, or particularly in the West and in English-speaking countries, there's, of course, many reasons, but at least one of the reasons that we've become anti-authoritarian or anti-government has been because we haven't been taught history properly at all. And I'll give you a couple of, exa of examples. You know, um, you know, people, most people in the West or people who speak English do not realize that you could not be a slave and also be, and also be Muslim. When you understand that, it's a lot easier to understand somebody like Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, and so on and so forth. And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and so on and so forth. And why does that have consequences? And it has consequences because of this country that I'm in now, the United States, a lot of it, a lot of the people in power today, especially in real estate, receive that power, or I should say concentration of ownership, because of the ability to transport slaves into this country. And if we admit that to ourselves, we're sort of stuck because we, you know, one of the reasons we have such concentration of ownership is because slavery was such a big part of this country. Not just black slavery, but, you know, slavery from Asia and really anywhere that the United States invaded. And you can't have concentration of ownership to a certain level, up to a certain level, or beyond a certain level, and still claim to have a society that's based on merit. And one of the reasons that we've had military spending in this country overtake a lot of the economy is because of this idea that the military values merit more than civilian organizations. But in fact, you know, if, if you spend, if you have an unlimited budget, it's probably, it's very difficult to tell whether or not your system is truly based on merit or the perfection of propaganda. But I, I mentioned the slavery part simply because it's such an obvious thing. The, the word for black slaves in America was Negro. And 
you know, even Malcolm X, an expert, never really, never talked about this as far as I know. Because he wasn't able to make the connection between Catholicism, Catholic Spain, and the change in practice of slavery. And yet, if you speak Spanish, you know it's not Negro, it's Negro, black. That means that the people here that were slaves were referred to as a color, not just by the Catholic Church, but essentially any Christian in this country who either owned slaves or benefited from the practice of slavery. And it seems so obvious once you realize it, but if you realize it, then you're able to make that connection between Catholicism, concentration of ownership, especially in real estate, and political power. And if you make that connection, you're able to see why you also, as of today, have a concentration of Catholic political power in many places in the United States, including, at this point, the federal government. And that's difficult because we have a substantial number of African Americans here. And to the extent that they realize that their unequal status, whether legally or financially, is based on an immoral act by a, a tax-exempt group. Governance becomes not impossible, but much more difficult. And that's not the only, it's not the only sort of factoid that tells you how history in this country is mistaught. We always hear about the Chinese building the railroads. What was probably happening is that the Chinese were actually coming from either perhaps Taiwan or probably Hong Kong. In other words, they weren't necessarily coming from mainland China, they were coming from places that were colonized by the United States. And even today, one of the reasons we are trying to replicate our strategy against China, the same strategies that we used against the Soviet Union, one of the reasons that we're able to do that is because we just don't have Chinese people in this country, very, not very many of them. And in fact, there are, the United States has invested more in Singapore a tiny, tiny country that you can drive across in about an hour if you had a straight line across the country. More in Singapore than in all of China. And you can see that the United States obviously sees China as the next Soviet Union. It's trying to cripple the country economically. It's not going to work because the Soviet Union wasn't able to learn from other systems, whereas China is able to learn from Hong Kong as well as Singapore. And that's important because the reason that the Soviet Union failed is because it just wasn't able to match the financial expertise of the United States. In other words, it wasn't able to match the banking sector of the United States. And that's odd because you know, when I travel, I mean, I, I see banks from all over the place, right? I, I mean, I even see Middle Eastern banks when I travel. Uh, you know, I see uh, some banks from Taiwan and so on and so forth, but not from Russia. And that tells you that, you know, one of the reasons, in fact, the reason that the Soviet Union failed was its inability to use debt properly. And China is not going to have that problem because it's going to be able to learn from Singapore and Hong Kong. And that's why all of the measures that are being taken against China today are going to fail.
because in many cases, the same people that won the, Soviet, the Cold War against the Soviet Union are the same ones involved in the current strategy. Now, we talked about slavery. We talked about the word Negro, which really means Negro. We talked about how understanding just these two simple things requires you to be on some level against the practices of the Catholic Church. That then requires you on some level to be able to understand what the word Protestant means, which is of course protesting the Catholics, the Catholic Church in Europe. That requires you to understand why there was such a concentration of Catholic power within Germany. How did that happen when the Catholic Church is based in Italy today, the Vatican? How did that happen? And it happened, of course, because Italy is now one of the poorest countries in the world. It's essentially a mafia state. And at a certain point in time, the power structure of the Catholic Church went to Germany. That created a backlash. And suddenly we have a civil war in the mid 1800s. That's one of the reasons why in this country, the majority ethnic group is German, because you had a civil war in the 1850s. Then you had World War I and World War II. And they teach us about Martin Luther, but not, they don't really teach us that the Protestant Reformation was an anti-Catholic movement. And so the Catholic Church moved from modern day Italy to Germany, where it is now essentially restricted to the Saxony area, which also happens to have the largest concentration of military, United States military spending. You had that shift, Italy to Germany and then to the United States. If you understand that, you will understand why there are so many people of German descent here, but also, if you understand that, you will also understand why none of the founders of this country, the United States, were Catholic. Not one. They all owned slaves, every one of them, even Benjamin Franklin. But not one of them was Catholic. In fact, the Catholic Church was banned in New York City because the founders of this country believed, some of them did, that the Catholic Church was essentially a political movement seeking tax-exempt status rather than a religion seeking tax-exempt status in exchange for non-interference non with the state. That's history. And you can see how discrimination against the Catholic Church in this country has created problems because in some cases you have a shadow economy. In some cases, a lot of the drug trade, a lot of the illicit trade or services, in many cases, creates fertile grounds for minorities to enter into. And the genius of the Catholic Church may have very well have been that in using local police departments to take over or at least facilitate illicit trade and sex and drugs. If you figure that part out, you will also understand why police departments in America, for the most part, are either inefficient or corrupt because any, any, any entity that is that relies on secrecy and nepotism has a date with corruption in the future. So things start to make sense if you learn history properly. Even though something called the Protestant work ethic, you can understand that the Protestants were protesting the Catholic Church. What, was, what they were also doing was protesting the way that the Catholic Church was making money not just indulgences, but also, of course, the practice of chattel slavery. And so you see this, you see how the Protestant work ethic was something that occurred in opposition to the Catholic Church. You can see how the Protestants looked down on the Catholics as people who were lazy or criminals because they were Catholic. You can see how, again, that caused, in a sense, a shadow economy to flourish in this country.
which then co-opted police departments that were trying to manage the illicit trade and, of course, failed. So things start to make sense when you understand history in context, but it doesn't make it easier to get, to get along with people if you happen to have more knowledge about how things really work. <sighs> Seems to me that it'd be a lot easier to have a decent conversation if you at least shared the same, some sort of foundation and truth and you would, you would rather have a society where you maybe had fewer conversations, but more honest ones. But I don't know if that's something that, that any society has ever really tried, because typically the victors write the history and of course, when they do that, they leave out a lot of details. And when you go to a museum, by the way, you'll notice you have a lot of beautiful pictures, a lot of beautiful portraits. And what you also don't realize is that this, whoever is having their portrait done, for the most part, is probably quite rich. And so you're looking at a portrait of essentially the top 1%. That means that when, when you visit a lot of museums that have art, you're really looking at not the 99%. You're looking at a sliver in time and a sliver of the population. So, of course, that makes it very difficult to understand history. Because as time goes on, you're in a position where it becomes harder and harder to reach back in time and use the commonalities of human nature to make connections. So we've studied, we just talked about those issues and those are the fairly obvious ones in the United States where people are, are essentially misled. But it does give you some context. That's really the goal, is to try to create some context and then figure out where to go from here. trying to think of some other really obvious historical misunderstandings. Um, uh, those are the only those are the ones that pop into mind right now. Obviously there are many others. Oh, Hitler Youth. You have a situation where the National Socialists in Germany were able to attract a lot of people, both young and old in part because they perfected propaganda. And we know that because the New York Times in America did a glowing profile of Adolf Hitler. And in that profile, they talked about his love of the outdoors. And the way that the Nazis, the National Socialists, the way that, that they attracted the Hitler youth, young people, in such a broad spectrum, not just in Germany, but all over the world, was by appealing to what everyone loves, which one of which is nature. And so Hitler was marketed as somebody who loved the outdoors, who loved nature, and the Hitler Youth was not, you know, it was not a security program. It was really an outdoors program. And it worked. It gave the Nazis, which were a political party, it gave them credibility. If you have, say, a failing school system of some sort, and suddenly the government or political party opens these new programs, and your child comes home happy, it's easy to see why the adults might have decided that this political party was a good one for the country. And you can, what scares me is the fact that, you know, of course you have the outdoors, you have the environment. What scares me is that we are now in a position where environmentalism is also being marketed to us right here, all, and not just here, all over the world. And, you know, there's no doubt that pollution is a massive problem all over the world. 
And, but we've known about this for quite some time. One of my favorite songs is from Scatman John. And in, in the 1990s, he had a line in perhaps his best song that, that said, if, let's see, if one of your solutions, let's see, if one of your solutions isn't fixing the pollution, then your story's told. And so we've always known about this. And the question is, what took us so long? And why will it continue to take quite a bit of time before the world shifts over to quote unquote clean energy? And furthermore, whether or not a lot of this is to get political points with not just young people, but everyone in society. When of course, it's always, no matter what you do, there's always a cost benefit analysis involved. In this case, the idea is that, let's say you want to have wind or solar panels replacing existing infrastructure, the idea is that you will also have to have a lot of land that is reserved for that purpose in order to generate the kilowatts or whatever metric is involved. And of course, if you're taking over that amount of land, the question is whether you're truly helping the environment over the long term. And I suppose no matter what we do, it's probably going to be safer than in the long term, safer and less polluted, polluted than oil. But you sort of wonder whether or not there's, a spa there's space for nuclear energy as well as, of course, natural gas or LNG. But if you're trying to create political advertising, no one ever won by on a platform of cost-benefit analysis. Most people that win, especially the youth, advertise a platform of change. And that's been the method. That's obviously something that appeals to human nature, and that's why it works. The question is, if we want to prevent a repeat of history with all these wars and all these conflicts, the question is whether we can continue to misteach or misrepresent history. And also to create a situation where the issues of cost benefit analysis are not taught properly, as well as symbolic logic. And in some cases, it's quite simple. My physics teacher in high school had a banner that said, there is no free lunch. There is no free lunch. That's basically cost benefit analysis. Whatever you do will have an upside or a downside. The question is how to minimize the downside and maximize the upside. But thus far, there's never been a political party that's run on that platform. It doesn't work. In a society where most people under the age of 30 are, especially when they're in debt, or interested in change and are idealistic enough to believe it will happen. The question is whether Western democracies are going to be able to succeed using the truth. And one of the reasons that we're here in this, society, in this position is not only because of the time-tested or time-honored tradition of the young rebelling against the old, because if it was just the young against the old, that familiar pattern, we wouldn't have such pernicious social problems. We would have normal social problems, the good kind. But we don't have those kinds of problems. We have something that's far more serious. I suppose, I just thought about another uh, myth, perhaps. This is going to be much more controversial. 
you know, the within this country, there has been ample evidence of anti-gay or anti-homosexual discrimination. One of the incidents that functions as evidence would be, I believe it was the Greenwich Village riots in response to police intervention or raids of facilities in New York. And we can look at that as an anti-gay policy, or we can look at that as this idea that the gay population has, for the most part, a platform of more freedom, more sexual partners, and that kind of libertine attitude on average allows for more experimentation, including in the drug trade. And so we're taught that these raids and riots occurred as the police against this, against this minority group. It may very well have been that the police were following orders to eradicate a black market of drugs or other illicit substances. And in fact, the police in this country, because they're linked to real estate ownership and real estate owners oftentimes are following a policy of what I call shopping mall development and hotel development. And as a result are in many cases acting in a way to preserve the status quo. And that means they would be against a real estate situation involving mostly nightclubs or other kinds of establishments that would interfere essentially with the types of real estate development in existence or favored by the status quo. And so ultimately, what, though we're taught discrimination is involved, the question is whether it's an overall attempt to maximize stability and predictability for the status quo especially with respect to real estate ownership and concentration of power. We talked about the Cold War against China today. Today, um, We talked about how that's why it's probably not going to succeed. And so the other myth that I just thought about would be the myth of American diversity. And what Paul Thoreau, a travel writer, says is that the United States doesn't really value diversity. The United States has a, has a lot of space, you know, so we can, a lot of land, and not, that, not very many people relative to the amount of land. And so the United States mistakes its tolerance and its elbow room for a love of diversity. And that's probably true because we don't really have that many people who are Chinese in this country. This makes it again easier to have a policy that's anti-China. And what most people don't understand is that if they see somebody in this country who is Asian, it's most likely somebody who is Japanese, South Korean, Taiwanese, uh, really anything, or Vietnamese in San Jose, really anything but Chinese, maybe Hong Kong. And that, of course, is the connection between overall the wars that the United States has fought. And if you have a diversity, if you have diversity because you had to take in all the refugees from a country that you invaded, whether or not you won or lost, that's not really a level of diversity. That's something else. And you can see how if we were a country that valued diversity, we'd probably have more Chinese people in this country. We'd probably have more investments in China. And so by not valuing diversity, we've set ourselves up for a collision course against China. And of course we have Japanese here because of World War II. We have internment camps, not just in the United States, but in Canada, Vietnam. Of course, we attempted to take over South Vietnam. We failed. We had to take in those people and bring them back over here. 
particularly in San Jose, South Korea, we fought a war. There was a truce. Again, we took in people and we tried to help the economy in order to maintain American influence overseas, especially with respect to banking and technological standards and so on and so forth. African Americans are obviously here because of chattel slavery. And so when we talk about making a more perfect union, you can see how you have to have that, I, that attitude. Because if you have an economy or a structure where it's almost as if the left hand is fighting against the right hand, or perhaps the left hand is destructive and the right hand is forced to clean up after itself or its colleague, you can see how the United States has, has in a sense become bipolar or schizophrenic. Because if you have a country that's, ha that's running on out of control military spending, yeah, pursuing strategies, at least in Asia, that have failed since Vietnam, you can see how so much of the quote unquote progressive platform is really just a response to an economy that is split between a formal economy and an informal economy, all of which is reacting to trickle-down spending from the military post-World War II. And you can also see how it would benefit. It's a much more, you know, making a more perfect union is a much better platform than what I just told you. Namely, that the diversity that we have is in a sense forced upon us by the mistakes of the United States military and the United States civilian leadership. <sighs> and all of this has consequences that go far beyond fake news. It, when you live in a country where the people don't know their own history, it makes it, in, a, some, in some sense, intolerable to even to have a simple conversation with someone else, at least one that involves substance. And what, what's the United States really good at right now? They're good at comedy. If you look at the movies, they're good at dystopias and comedies. They're very good at both of those things. And that may be the result of having an educational system that doesn't teach people history properly in this country. And so if we want to live in a world where a native born American is as interesting to talk to or worthy of being, of having a relationship with, at least one that's based on substance, and merit and a principle apart from banking strength and currency strength. If we're interested in that kind of a society, it seems to me that we really do have to teach history properly, even if it makes it harder initially to get along with one's neighbors and makes it harder to make a movie that is one-sided. Because if you look at the movies that were made in the past, a lot of those movies, including ones made by top-tier Hollywood stars, were anti-military. In particular, one of them is called The Americanization of Emily. It starred Julie Andrews. It's a completely anti-military film. We don't have any of those films anymore. We have Oliver, we had quite a few decades ago, we had a few films by Oliver Stone. They weren't really anti-military, 
so much as they just happened to point out the people that were left behind, both at home and overseas. And you can see how if you live in a country where it's running on military spending, you're in a trickle-down economy paradigm, and yet you don't have anything that's critical of the military, you can see how that would create a vacuum. And of course, right now, that vacuum is being filled with fake news. And because of that, we have more division than ever before, despite having perhaps more prosperity than ever before. And there's a, there's a sense that just none, of, none of this is going to change unless we decide to be more honest with ourselves. Here's another interesting tidbit. Audrey Hepburn, since we're talking about Hollywood stars, her parents were pro-Nazi. They supported Adolf Hitler's party. Uh, the propaganda was amazing. And of course, the Germany at the time was number one in math and science. And it had a lot of debt. And you can see how it's a little bit co concerning to be an American right now in a country that is also number one in math and science for the most part, especially on the digital side. But especially concerning because once you understand that we've moved from the finite into the infinite, from the tangible into the intangible, that we really can to the extent that we maintain top tier status in math, science, and, and engineering, the ability to propagate propaganda is probably also infinite. And so there's a sense, especially with the level of debt that this country has, both uh, individually and as a whole, corporate and governmental, there's also a sense that a day of reckoning will be upon us at some point. Because history shows the countries that run on military spending without criticism, in many cases, lack the wisdom to succeed on a long-term basis. What to do? Well, for starters, let's teach history properly. <laughs>